Well, if you thought we couldn't get any brainier, brace yourselves, we're about to get brainier, uh, because our next speaker used his own brain, the own power and smarts of his own brain, to produce another brain. That takes smarts. Chris Eli Smith studies theoretical neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. Chris is interesting for, for a lot of reasons. One of them is that um, his discipline is quote unquote non-traditional. Um, he studied engineering in his undergrad. He went on to do a master's in philosophy. His PhD is in philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology. So he's sort of um, done what we all, we all talk about universities should do, is do cross-disciplinary things and bring them together. And that's what Chris has done. Chris's creation, it's an artificial brain called Spawn, S-P-A-U-N. He will tell you why it's called that. Um, and Spawn is teaching the world about everything from mental illness to new computing methods. And Chris is arguing that what matters now is figuring how out how our brains work. Chris. Thanks. Imagine if we understood how our brains worked. We could help millions of Canadians who suffer from mental disorders and save the country upward of $51 billion a year. We could test new kinds of drugs and new direct brain stimulation techniques to help us with everything from Alzheimer's to stroke while endangering far fewer humans and other animals. We could build new kinds of machine intelligence to help us with everything from the complex to the mundane. Imagine having a robot that could do your chores for you or a web assistant that could help you research some complex problem. And most of all, it would just be really cool. <laughs> it might even change how we think about who we are but how are we going to do this? How are we going to understand what is one of the most complex physical systems in the universe? The brain has 80 billion neurons, almost a quadrillion connections. It's more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer, even that one we saw before, but it only uses the energy of a compact fluorescent light bulb. It weighs about three pounds, but it controls everything that we do, think, and feel. So how are we going to understand the brain? In fact, Richard, uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist, had a suggestion that we can use. After he had died, on his blackboard, the following was written. It said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And in fact, many researchers in my field have been adopting this suggestion and essentially thinking that if we really understand how the brain works, we should be able to build one. Now, by building a brain, I really mean building a computer simulation of one just like you might build a simulation of a, an engine of a car to show that you know how that works. In the case of a brain, we want to simulate individual neurons. So we'd want to simulate the input coming into those neurons in the form of ionic currents. And we want to simulate the output in the form of brief pulses of voltage. And if we simulate hundreds or thousands or even millions of these neurons, and maybe most importantly, if we understand how to connect them together in the right ways, we know that we can get them to perform interesting functions. And this really brings me to the work that's been going on in my lab recently. In short, what Pia said was true. About a year ago, we built what is still the world's largest functional brain model. And it's called SPAWN, which stands for Semantic Pointer Architecture Unified Network. I'm not going to explain that. I just wanted to let you know that it is not in any way evil. It's just an acronym. And SPAWN has about 2.5 million of these simulated neurons. And here we can see it performing a simple recognition task. So what we've done here is we've shown spawn images, just like the ones that would appear to your eye, and they're handwritten digits that we're showing it. It's then using that information to try to figure out what the digit is, so it's doing classification, and then it's moving its arm in order to draw out what digit it, think was, it thinks was there. And when we run this model, we can generate these kinds of images, which are sort of reminiscent of something like fMRI data that you've probably seen in newspapers. But more interestingly, we can actually read Spawn's mind. We can look at the things that it's seeing. We can watch as it remembers the information that it's been presented with. And we can see as it figures out which points it wants to move its arm through in order to produce its result. And the only reason we can do this is because we've built a computer simulation. So as you can see in the background here, we have all of these outputs I was talking about, these brief pulses of voltage that are coming out of the neurons, and we have access to that information from every single neuron in this artificial brain. 
And the only reason we have that kind of detailed access to the mechanisms is because we've built a simulation. So I think it's interesting to know that we can take all these sort of brain-like parts, we can put them together, and they can do some kind of interesting function. But what would be far more interesting is if we could show that it could do lots of different functions. One thing that really distinguishes humans from machines is really our cognitive flexibility. So machines are often highly specialized. They're very good at one task, often a repetitive task. But humans, in contrast, are very flexible. We can go from driving a car to answering an email to doing research on a complex problem, all in a matter of minutes. And because biological flexibility is so important to cognition, we thought it was important for Spawn to be able to do lots of different kinds of things. So Spawn can do this sort of recognition task, but it can also count. It can reproduce different styles of drawings. It can do some kinds of gambling tasks. It can remember lists of numbers and so on. And I'm going to show you another task that Spawn can do. In fact, I'm going to let you do the task. So this is a puzzle, and your job is to figure out what goes in this bottom right-hand corner where the question mark is. And this kind of puzzle is actually one that in the animal kingdom only humans can solve. So it's a difficult puzzle. And I've given you a brief moment to look at it, so hopefully you'll have some idea what goes in that last square. And if not, we can watch Spawn solve this puzzle. So we can see as the information is presented to Spawn through its visual system, and it's really trying to figure out what the pattern in the digits is here. It's never seen this set of digits before. So it's using its visual system, its memory, and other parts of the brain in order to figure out what the pattern is in those digits. And then when it comes to the end, it's going to write out its answer. And because it's a video, it gets it right every time. <laughs> now, it was important for us to show that Spawn could do these kinds of tasks because we wanted to argue that our methods are not only useful for things like doing recognition tasks, which in fact lots of animals can do, but they can actually do tasks which are cognitive, essentially uniquely human. And we not only wanted to show that it could do those tasks, we wanted to argue that it's doing these tasks in a human-like way. So here's another task that Spawn's doing. And this is remembering a list of digits. And we can watch those digits as they're loaded into the working memory. But you'll notice that one of the digits begins to fade. It's essentially forgetting that information. And so as it's writing out its answer, when it comes to that number eight, it actually draws a horizontal line to indicate that it doesn't know what's in that location, but then it completes the list. And if we give exactly this same kind of in, uh, task to humans, they make these same kinds of errors. In short, just like you, Spawn remembers the beginning of the list and the end of the list much better than the middle of the list. And this is true for any length of list. So what we've done is we've simulated millions of neurons, and we've got them to do interesting things. Now, I'm the first to admit that Spawn is much simpler than a real brain. It only really knows about the digits from 0 to 9. It only has about 20 of the 1,000 or so brain areas that we know about, and it only really has parts of those brain areas. It, in fact, has 40,000 times fewer neurons than we find in the real brain. And of course, it does way fewer tasks. But it is a huge improvement over what there was before. And I think this is why research like this matters. In short, Spawn uniquely combines biological realism with actual function, with actual behavior. So now we can begin to use the model in lots of different ways. So we've built models like Spawn that help us understand cognitive performance and the effects of aging on cognitive performance. So for instance, we take a model like Spawn, we show it a lot of actual intelligence tests, we can collect its results, and then we can see what manipulations can we make to make those uh, results decline. Uh, and in this way, we can come to understand why we get dumber as we get older. Right? This is no way to sugarcoat that. We can also take models like this and damage them. So we've built models like Spawn, damaged them, and looked at the effects of stroke and shown uh, that different kinds of interventions can help alleviate those effects. We can look at the effects of drugs on brain function. So Spawn has a dopamine signal in it, and dopamine is one of the major targets of drugs for Parkinson's disease. And we can also use the knowledge that we gain from Spawn to really answer some interesting questions like, what is the difference between biological computation and digital computation? And this is why we've been working with groups around the world to actually build the next generation of powerful, efficient computing platforms that, platforms that work more like the brain. We can also look at these models and extract algorithms from them. We've extracted algorithms from models like Spawn to build new kinds of controllers for robot arms, for quadcopters, and to understand natural language. In short, I think Spawn matters 
because it's beginning to give us a sense of how the brain actually works. Thank you.